everybody. My name's Taylor, and like Dr. Fried said, my presentation today is on sodium restriction in CHF. So this is my agenda for the day. I'm going to talk about where we are today with the sodium restriction hypothesis, and then I'm going to go into the history behind this hypothesis. I'm going to talk a little bit about the pathophysiology, we'll do some studies, and then we'll do a summary. So to start out, I think we've all been told at some point during our medical careers that CHF patients should restrict their salt intake. Um, dietary sodium restriction is arguably the most frequent self-care behavior recommended to patients with heart failure. Um, and for example, this is from Cottage Health's own discharge instructions for patients going home with a diagnosis of CHF. So you can see here that we're sending patients home with this handout saying to avoid pickles, olives, processed meats, canned foods, etc. And so I took a few screenshots of different um, guidelines for patients from different uh, healthcare organizations, their websites. This is, for example, from the CDC's website for patients with C CHF. Um, as you can see here in the middle, it says to reduce their sodium intake in their diet. This is from the Heart Failure Society of America. They have a whole module on their website on how to follow a low sodium diet. This is specifically geared towards patients. This is from Kaiser Permanente. They have a booklet that they send home with their patients who have a diagnosis of CHF. And um, within the booklet, they kind of explain to their patients when you eat too much salt, your body holds on to too much fluid, your heart works harder, and then you have swelling and shortness of breath. This is from Mayo Clinic. You can see here down at the bottom, they tell their patients to restrict their sodium in their diet. And then our trusted up-to-date as well. Um, it's the patient education heart failure beyond the basics, diet and lifestyle, uh, decrease salt and water. <coughs> so this is a table of the guideline recommendations of major health care organizations around the world. Um, you can see here at the top, the National Heart Foundation of Australia, Cardiac Society of Australia and New Zealand. They recommend less than three grams per day for NYHA class two without peripheral edema, less than two grams per day for NYHA class three and four. I'm sorry, it's a little bit small font. Um, but you can see here that the level of ed evidence is C. And you go down here to the American College of Cardiology, the American Heart Association, and we're recommending moderate restriction less than two grams per day if volume overload, followed by fluid intake restriction to two liters per day if fluid retention persists. And again, our level of evidence is C. Um, same thing, Heart Failure Society of America, level of evidence C. And you can see down at the bottom, it says level of, level of evidence C is limited populations evaluated, only consensus opinion of experts, case studies, or standard of care. So on average, Americans consume between 3.4 to 3.7 grams of sodium per day. And to put this in perspective, a three pickles roasted turkey sandwich is about 1,400 milligrams of sodium. And a one eight ounce bag of laced potato chips is 1,196. So that's pretty much almost at the recommended intake per the um, Heart Failure Society of America. The history of the sodium hypothesis, um, the earliest mention of edema affecting, or diet affecting edema was 1866. I found a paper um, by Carell, and this person observed that a diet consisting of 600 to 800 cc's of milk a day, that's the only thing that they fed their edematous patients, um, that often caused diuresis. In 1901, Archard and Leeper fed patients with CHF salt and then they noted that the sodium was not excreted in the urine as it was in normal patients. And then they also tested the blood sodium and um, it did not rise either. So then they thought that the excess sodium kind of like settled in the tissues and caused edema. 1916, Dr. Frank Billings of Rush um, tested the kidney's ability to excrete sodium. And he fed patients what's called the salt poor diet. And this consisted of three quarters of a liter of milk, four eggs, 150 grams of bread, enough fruit, fruit juice, tea, and sugar to make it palatable. And this was about three grams of salt. And then he tested the urine of these patients to make sure that the three grams were excreted. And then he was 
he gave the, the patients more sodium after that, or salt after that, above the three grams, and then noted how much edema that the patients had. Um, and this was the recommended diet at the time for patients with chronic cardi cardiac valvular disease, ascites of cirrhosis, pleurisy with effusion, arterial sclerosis, and diabetes insipidus. Um, and then of note down here, I just um, took a screenshot of the salt poor diet, and it said that the diet of civilized man contained ordinarily 10 to 15 grams of common salt, and salt is 40% sodium, so that's four to six grams of sodium that these people were taking in every day compared to like the three to four that we have these days, so that's a lot. Uh, 1941, a man named Schroeder was the first person to investigate the relationship between salt intake and the edema of heart failure. He took just 23 patients of obstinate cases of congestive heart failure and gave them the same amount of salt. Um, and then he also noticed a decrease in the amount of edema based on the excretion of sodium. So a little bit about the pathophysiology of heart failure. Um, there's some kind of insult to the myocardium. You, you get decreased cardiac output, um, which decreases the renal perfusion, and you get activation of the sympathetic nervous system. Um, and then you also have an activation of the renin aldosterone and angiotensin system, leads to sodium and water retention. So, Normally there's a balance between the natriuretic peptide system and the RAS system, but in heart failure, um, the natriuretic peptides are not able to be cleaved properly. So they normally function to inhibit the, the um, aldosterone and the sympathetic tone. So when they're not cleaved properly in heart failure exacerbations especially, you get um, a balance towards the RAS system. There's a lot of anecdotal evidence that heart failure exacerbations are increased around the holidays, especially around Thanksgiving. Um, I looked into this with any literature to support this, and I found this one st study by Shaw, and it was titled Heart Failure in the Holidays. And um, they found increased heart failure admissions immediately following Christmas and Fourth of July. And um, they attributed these increase in admissions to overeating, emotional stressors, lesser exercise, exercise, and postponing medical care. They didn't mention anything about sodium intake. Um, and then there's been other studies that report fluid overload secondary to um, a high sodium diet is the most common reason for rehospitalization and decompensation of heart failure. Um, all of these studies, though, were the the dietary sodium intake was reported by um, self-reporting or like medical record review, which is not very sensitive or specific. Um, so there's been a few mechanisms that uh, kind of support this the salt restriction diet. Um, the first, there's a correlation between salt intake and hypertension, and hypertension has is known to cause cardiomyopathy. Um, second, there is evidence of left ventricular mass reduction during salt depletion, and this was seen in a study in hypertension in the 80s. There's a lot of new research to suggest that neurohormonal changes um, accompany salt restriction. So there's one study that I found by Damgard and colleagues, and they found a decrease in the cardiac index and stroke volume and an increase in pulmonary vascular resistance in patients whose sodium was restricted. And the thought behind this is that sodium normally um, functions to increase the intravascular volume. Um, there's been other studies that demonstrate that sodium restriction decreases renal perfusion along the same lines as the um, depletion of the intravascular volume. And then you also get activation of the renin, angiotensin, and aldosterone system, sympathetic activity. Um, however, none of these studies ever mention what medicines the patients were taking, if they were even really on a diuretic, or if they were on an aldosterone blocker, or anything like that. So it's kind of hard to interpret those results. Um, there's been observational data to suggest an association between sodium intake and risk for hospitalization. This study was kind of curious because um, it showed that sodium intake less than three grams was associated with a higher risk for hospitalization and death in patients with NYHA class one to two 
but then the patients who had a sodium intake greater than three grams per day were two and a half times more likely to be hospitalized for cardiac problems or die in NYHA class three and four. So it's kind of both ends of the spectrum. Um, and then again, in this study, the um, level of dietary sodium intake was estimated by measurement of 24-hour urinary sodium exc excretion. Um, this only really shows the 24 hours of what patients were eating, so it doesn't really predict long-term um, sodium intake. This is a um, systematic review that just came out in JAMA last month, actually, November 5th, um, and it was titled Reduced Salt, Salt Intake for Heart Failure, and it is a systematic review of over 2,500 randomized control trials assessing associations of sodium restriction and heart failure. Out of the 2,500 studies, only nine were deemed suitable for inclusion, none included outcomes of clinical interest, and none were considered high quality or free of bias. Um, there were two, I'll show you the table. There were two studies that actually favored intervention out of all of those 2,500, and they were both outpatient studies. So the, the nine that they included um, two were inpatient, and then the rest were outpatient. And you can see here that the number of participants weren't, wasn't that great in any of the studies. Um, so for the Colin Ramirez trial in Mexico, the one that favored intervention, again, this is an outpatient study, um, it did not mention any of the medications that the participants were taking, and the sodium intake was determined by a three-day food questionnaire. Um, the Philipson et al. study um, actually did mention the medication regimen that the patients were taking, and it stated that the patients were taking the maximum tolerated beta blocker, ACE or ARB, um, and then 80 milligrams of Lasix daily. And then none of the patients had um, an exacerbation of heart failure that were included, and no medication changes in the last two weeks prior to study inclusion. So in light of all this data, the American Heart Association and the American College of Cardiology Foundation put out a statement um, in their guidelines in 2013 regarding sodium restriction. They acknowledge that the data to support this recommendation is modest, and there's a lot of variances in protocol, fluid intake, and then the measurement of sodium intake is a problem, compliance with the diet is a problem. Um, they state that it's unclear whether to recommend sodium restriction across the different patient populations um, because there's a difference in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction versus preser preserved ej ejection fraction, and most of the studies I saw only focused on the heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Also, there's differences, wide range of the NYHA class and the cardiac or the heart failure related morbidities such as renal dysfunction, age and race also plays a role as well. So in light of all this, they do recommend sodium restriction to 1.5 grams per day for stage C and D heart failure, just given that there is an association between sodium intake and hypertension and possibly left ventricular hypertrophy. So in summary, despite the widespread advocacy, there's a lot of uncertainty about the data, and um, it's at the end of the day, it's just not very good. It's a very difficult uh, um, topic to study. There's the mechanism behind the whole neurohormonal system is very complicated, and then it's additionally confounded by renal dysfunction and medications that patients take. And pretty much all the studies have recall bias uh, because of the food frequency questionnaires. Most of the studies focused on patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fractions, mostly white patients. And out of all the studies that I saw, only one um, study stated that patients were optimally treated, the one that I went over. And these are my sources. And do you guys have any questions? <laughs> All right, that was great. Um, any comments from the peanut gallery? Yeah, was there just one, I think it was a study, that showed the opposite effect of sodium restriction? Mm -hmm. There's only one, and everything else kind of showed the opposite. No, there's, there were a lot of studies that actually showed um, that sodium restriction was beneficial, but like I said, they were all, you know, like question-based 
based um, questionnaires, um, the 24-hour so sodium excretion in the urine. So the ways that they studied the sodium intake weren't that good. They were all biased. That's right. And then, I think you're talking about the opposite. The, opposite. The, the one study that you presented, I think he's talking about the one study that you mentioned that actually showed um, that they did worse with a low-sodium diet. Yeah, because in my mind, it's kind of like if most of it is kind of anecdotal and it's not really that well proven, uh, and it, it, you know, if, if there is actually a detriment to the sodium restricting, then we can kind of you know, we should dive more into it. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot of studies that are being performed now based on that, based on you know, like the poor renal perfusion and the activation of the sympathetic nervous system with the sodium restriction. So. Um, it's just kind of hard to say because there's a lot of studies that say, yes, it's beneficial and it's detrimental. My question was regard, regarding to, you mentioned overeating as a cause around Christmas and mm -hmm. um, you know, 4th of July. So how much of that could be quantified to what they ate? Or yeah, it's possible. It's just that the study didn't specifically say anything about sodium. So, I mean, maybe that's implied. It's just hard to say for sure. Okay, so this is the statement. Patients with CHF should have their diets restricted to two grams sodium or less. It's commonly done. Pretty much everybody in the room has ordered this at one time or another, probably almost every day, um, including myself. So the question is, is this, you know, you have to balance the, the other thing, and, and again, I am not going to vote, but I am going to comment. <laughs> you, you know, you have to you have to balance, you know, um, how hard it is to actually stick to a two gram or less, or even fifteen hundred milligrams, which they were recommending. Sodium diet is extremely difficult. A lot of these studies were done without any control of medication, and. As I always say, there's probably not a sodium diet that you couldn't fix with enough Lasix. So um, <laughs> if these people were appropriately managed with diuretics, maybe it would all be a moot point. Um, we can ask the two dietitians that are here, as long as they're here, just if they want to comment on how hard it is for patients to, to actually stick to these diets. Because we prescribe them all the time, but I don't think most people adhere to them. And when you prescribe them in the hospital, um, to me, it would be better, if they're not going to follow it at home, to just keep them on a regular diet here so you can adjust their medications and their diuretics while they're here and um, kind of counteract the sodium effects, if there are any. Um, but how hard is it? It's, it's really hard. And that's exactly a good point, that we put people on these huge restrictions while they're here. And we're, it's all computerized, so we count every milligram of sodium someone's getting. And then they go home, and you know, if it's not sustainable and they have no plans of doing it at home, are we doing more harm than good? No. No other comments? Come on. Sure, I have a comment. So I think, um, obviously, I'm not a physician, but it, it seems that the whole issue of CHF is not just isolated to sodium intake, but rather there's other factors like exercise, et cetera, from what I've read, that are, can have just as much impact on CHF as the diet. So I think um, there needs to be more looked at that. Okay, time to um, vote. So how many people think that Patients generally with congestive heart failure should be restricted to two grams sodium or less in their diet based on the evidence. Okay. How many think it's plausible? A lot. Wow. And how many think it's busted? Okay. I'm not voting. <laughs> All right. Well, then. It's the first time we've seen that one, right? Okay, everybody's excited.